Well, actually, there are some very significant winners at the moment. First-time buyers have been given a massive leg up over the last few months because interest rates have come down to very, very low levels. Mortgages have never been so low. And the government, because of the post-COVID response, was trying to get people to buy property. And so they gave huge opportunities by way of um, extra money or indeed guaranteeing loans to get first-time buyers to come into the market. So we've seen a massive peak at recent times of first-time buyers coming into the market. Quite a few of them actually borrowing from parents to get in as well. So if you actually put together the money that they have saved, the money they get from the government, the money from parents, many first-time buyers are in the market. So they're definitely winners. The second area of winners are people moving from the major cities into the regional areas. We've seen a massive drift over the last 6 to 12 months of people selling up and moving out and buying houses out in the regions. Now, prices have always been lower out in the regions, so that means that uh, they can buy bigger and better. Sometimes they call it a tree change or a sea change, um, you know, going from the smoke of the city to the... Um, quiet countryside. In fact, I live in the regional area here, close to the sea. And there's a lot of that going on. So that was another winning area. The absolute losers have been property investors who bought high-rise apartments over the last four or five years, expecting that they're going to make a huge capital return and expecting that their rental streams would be very strong. Neither of those have happened. Firstly, because our migration has gone negative, so we haven't got any international migration coming in at all at the moment, uh, and a lot of those were students, of course, previously. Um, so the rentals are much lower, on average 20% down from where they were, if you can find anybody to rent your property. In addition, a lot of the high-rise was proved to be poorly constructed, so we've got defects, cracks, we've got flammable plowing and all those things. So they're not getting the rental streams and neither are they getting the tenants. So we're seeing massive capital loss in the investment sector, particularly the high rise sector. So they are some of the big losers in all this. And then it just regionally, what's quite interesting as well, it's the major cities. So close into Sydney and Melbourne, our two major centres, quite a few people there have still seen values sitting below where they were back in 2017. Although in the West, in Western Australia, a huge winner over there because they were able to put the barriers up to stop COVID uh, entering the state pretty, pretty well. The mining boom has come back again, thanks to China. And so the people in the West are beginning to see their property prices moving up very smartly from a low, wait for it, of 2013. There are four. The first is properties are too expensive relative to income. If you look at the average ratio to income, go back a few years, it was three and a half to four. It's now six to seven to eight. So people are having to put a larger proportion of their income to get into the property sector. And that is in a context where real incomes have not grown since 2011 in Australia. So you know, inflation adjusted, incomes are the same as they were. So people, on housing affordability is, is a real problem. The second is that we have built massive amounts of cookie cutter property, um, development zones around the major towns and also in the high rise. So you've got a lot of property that's very similar to a lot of other property. And that means that if you're trying to sell then you are competing with lots of other people who's trying to sell precisely the same properties at the same time. And quite often you are competing directly with new off-the-plan properties which people would prefer to buy. So quite often what you find is that people who have bought in the last two or three years when they come to sell, they can't sell because you know, their property is just not as attractive. Would you buy new or would you prefer a second-hand property? You'd prefer new if you could get it. So that's that's a a big deal. The third is that we've got incentives for property investors to hold more and more properties and that includes 
um, what's called negative gearing. So basically you get tax refunds on the interest that you pay on your property. And so that has created a completely distorted market where you've got 30% or th more of all property owned by property investors. And a lot of those property investors are mum and dad investors. They might have one or two properties, but quite a few have lots and lots of properties because of the tax um, regime that I mentioned. And what that means is that you've actually got a lot of people who are highly exposed to, into property, not just in their main property that they own, but also through their investment properties. So in a downturn, there are huge risks. The final one is what I call the financialization of property, which is taking it even further. People have become fixated on the idea that property can never really go up. In Australia, if you survey households, most people will say, well, property prices double religiously every seven years, right? Which means that there is a huge amount of incentive for people to go in and buy property expecting it to go up. Except if you look at the real data, that has not been true for a long, long time. And in fact, in many areas, it's never been true. But because of that, you've got this huge fixation on property. You've got a massive building construction sector, one million people working in the construction sector, which is why the government then gives incentives to try and uh, keep the uh, property market going. And if you add it all up, what you end up with is a distorted economy where too much of the economy is actually property related, where there isn't enough investment in other things that would actually lay a foundation for a better future in terms of manufacturing, in terms of innovation. So we've got this sort of sinkhole. The analogy I think of it sometimes, it's like the, um, the black hole, right? We're circling a black hole and that black hole is the property sector and it's sucking in finance. So the banks lend more and more to the finan uh, finance, to the property sector. The construction sector builds more and more properties. The whole thing is driven on the assumption that property prices will continue to go up. Mortgage books get bigger. That means that banks get more profitable. So it's all myopic. It's all skewed around property. And unfortunately, my view is that we are close now to the point of peak property, where effectively you can't, this can't go on forever, even with low interest rates, even with all the quantitative easing, or with even with all the government incentives. At some point, this is going to come unglued, especially with the borders closed and with no net migration. I think you have to go right back to the deregulation phase of financial services, which in Australia was in the 1990s. We had quite a, um, a controlled environment for lending and uh, a lot of banks you know, wanted to be able to lend more uh, at a time when effectively there was a strong push towards privatisation of the banking system and to turn the banking system from being something which supports the economy to being a profit centre in its own right. So that deregulation of the financial system for my sort of two penny worth is actually what's really driven this, right? Once we get that, got that, we then had significant momentum because banks were able then to lend more. So the lending standards came significantly down. That meant that people could actually get greater multiples of mortgages. You know, it used to be three and a half times. It's now a lot higher. Um, Plus the fact that the investment sector started to take off. So, you know, around the 90s, there was very little property for investment purposes. There was a bit, but not a lot. But then it became the way to get rich. So in the 2000s in particular, um, it became a very significant driver at the time when we had strong migration. So we had a lot of influx of foreigners who needed places to live. And at the time, the building sector argued that there was a huge undersupply of property. We need to build a lot more. So they started building a lot more. The government supported that because it drove the GDP the right way. And then the Reserve Bank in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, off the back of the mining um, easing back. So we had a very significant mining boom. Then we had the global financial crisis and all of that sort of fell apart. So what then happened was the Reserve Bank our central bank decided that they needed to actually use households and household balance sheets as the next driving engine for growth, which basically meant allowing the banks to lend ever more for property. It allowed property prices to expand. It allowed construction to expand. 
And so that narrowing of the overall economy around housing was basically driven by the Reserve Bank's policies. They also cut rates in subsequent years to keep that Ponzi scheme going. It is a Ponzi scheme, I'm afraid. And so those are the fundamental drivers. So banks looking to increase their profitability, the government through the Reserve Bank looking to use the housing sector and housing balance sheets to support GDP, and then the propaganda, you know, and this huge propaganda about property that started in the early 2000s, you know, easiest way to make money, buy property, hold property, stories in the press all the time about how you doubled your value in five years, you know, somebody bought eight properties and then bought another eight. I mean, all of those stories. And by the way, they're still going on today. So there is a propaganda element. And so it's become mythology in Australia that the best way to make money is to buy property, lots of it, hold it, buy more, cross-leverage. And interestingly, one of the other things I will just touch on, I mentioned cross-leverage, is that you can actually use the equity from one property to then buy another property to buy another property, to buy another property. And so that cross-leverage, um, that um, set of dominoes, you know, if everything goes up, it's all good. But of course, that also creates huge risks on the downside. So if prices start to fall, then we get into difficulty. And today, we do have a number of households who are in significant financial pressure because of either they're cross-leveraged or over-leveraged, or because they've lost their jobs because of COVID or they can't pay their mortgage. So it's created this precarious environment for a large proportion of property owners, about one and a half million in, in, in my estimates, which is about a third of the total, um, who basically are close to the edge and just hanging on by their fingernails. So we've got this distorted social fabric that we've created off the back of that with property at its heart. And I'm afraid that we've got to now find a way in my view to unwind some of this which is very hard to do because it's what I call the financialization of property it's become the leading indicator of success the critical thing that the government always comes back to to give it another kick down the road and most people still believe that property is the best way to make money Yeah, so we've had a lot of government payments made um, through to people through COVID. So there was a thing called JobKeeper here, which basically was money paid to businesses to pay salaries for people who are workers. And that's been big. And we've had a number of other schemes too, as well as direct incentives to try and get people to buy property. So there's been a lot of propping up. Yeah, and so the question now is, as they remove those incentives, what's going to happen? Also, the banks were uh, allowed to give people mortgage and interest repayment holidays for the last few months, since um, you know about March last year. So we have a whole bunch of people who have not paid their mortgages for quite some time. Now, quite a few of them are coming back on stream now, but we still have a number of people who are in some difficulty. But what is interesting is that the government is actually using this opportunity to give the property market another leg up. And in fact, there are people within government who are saying, well, you know, if you've got um, money in your superannuation or pension fund, why don't you just take that money out and use that to buy property? And in fact, one of the things they did a few months ago was to allow people to pull out $10,000 um, last financial year, $10,000 this financial year, and a huge number of people just pulled those savings out of their long-term pension fund to buy property. So, yeah, pretty much everywhere you look, there are government supports and sort of incentives to try and drive the property market forward. But as that tide goes out a little, I would expect to see some relief but property prices have really taken a leg up in the last few months not least because of course the uh, reserve bank took interest rates down to a stupid 0.1 percent um, you know that's the sort of the cash rate benchmark right and the average mortgage rate is now as low as two percent which is lower than it's ever been so we've got very cheap mortgages at the moment so we saw that work through it'll be a really interesting question to see as the incentives and stimulus packages are withdrawn Will the property sector settle back or will it just continue to take off? That will be what I'll be watching over the next couple of years. Oh.
Yeah, I can point to some areas where I would say that we've seen the worst side of humanity, not the best side of humanity, right? Give you a few examples. There's a lot of really cheap construction gone on over the last few years, right? With building firms created just to sort of build a, you know, a high rise and then basically just fold afterwards so that the, effectively the protections that should have been there for the subsequent years aren't there. So that's one example. And they've used really shoddy materials. They've uh, cut corners on certification. So we've got much higher numbers of shoddy buildings than we should have. In fact, there was a report quite recently that said there could be 20 to 30,000 bad buildings across Australia that need significant repair. And in some cases, the worst case is that costs a property owner forty to $50,000 to fix up. That is criminal. And it's also welded into the behavioural norms of much of the building sector. Now, they are regulators are trying to get on top of it, but they're way behind the eight ball. The second one is more concerning. We know that there is a lot of uh, money laundering and, uh, you know, funds coming through from overseas. We've got very limited um, controls on some of that relative to other countries. Real estate, lawyers is not actually within the ambit of the current um, uh, controls. So the banking system is directly, but not uh, some of those other sectors. And there's a lot of evidence that, um, for example, a lot of Asian money has come through buying high-end property as a way of money laundering internationally. And nobody knows the size of that with regard to the impact on the, um, on the building sector and on property. But my hypothesis is it's huge. And we also know that, um, you know, there is some resistance within government circles to tackle this because they're concerned, I think, that if they tackled it, it might actually put a significant break on the property market. So you could argue that um, government looks the other way and says, no, it's not a serious problem. In fact, there were recommendations in 2018 to fix it. And government said, yeah, we'll fix it, but they haven't done anything at all. So that's, a, you know, a bit of collusion there. Another example um, is this. The Reserve Bank's view is that credit is not important. In other words, how much debt is too much debt? That's not a question that's worth working because working, they're, they're what's called a Keynesian uh, philosophy, which basically says um, they'll stick money into the economy if things are weak and it'll actually bounce back and then they'll withdraw support if the economy is strong, right? But basically, interest and uh, principal servicing on mortgages and how much debt you have is not relevant because for every asset there's a debt, for every debt there's an asset, so it sort of cancels each other out. But that is a very myopic, and I frankly think, quite concerning approach because we're reaching the point now of peak debt where people can't take any more debt, and yet the Reserve Bank says we don't have a problem with debt. Now, I would regard that as um, incompetence at very least. And it's one that is also supported by Treasury, so the people who actually advise government, right? So we see this all the time. Um, and if you want one more, I'll give you one more. Two years ago, we had a Banking Royal Commission into bad practice in um, the banking sector. And that showed a whole bunch of horrible stories of people being um, persuaded to, to get large mortgages. In some cases, mortgage brokers forged signatures and... Uh, encourage people to apply for bigger loans. And in some cases, um, the, the what's called responsible lending obligations, which basically says you need to understand that these people can afford to make this, um, this commitment, weren't actually um, carried out. And so at the end of the Royal Commission, one of the things that the recommendations were was that responsible lending obligation, which basically said you've got to make quite sure that you are making lo loans that are suitable for people, is a really important piece of legislation and must be preserved. Two years later, last week in fact, the government tried to pass legislation to remove the responsible lending obligations on the argument was this is actually holding back banks' ability to lend. And we need a you know, lot of growth at the moment because of our post-COVID environment. They actually called it um, it's part of the recovery. Um, so basically they said, no, 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 take out responsible lending. It's part of the recovery. Now, interestingly, that bill went into the Senate, which is our upper house. And the Senate actually basically said, no, 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 we don't believe that's right. So the government lost 
their ability to get that responsible lending withdrawal bill out oh, and so it's still hanging there in space. But the fact that the government, when we've got such high debt and when we've got people who are up to their eyeballs in debt and you know, are clearly in some degree of risk, the fact that they actually would turn around and say, no, 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 what we're going to do is make it easier for banks to lend and put all of the acid back on borrowers. So basically under the changes that they were proposing, it's all down to if somebody wants to borrow, that's fine. It's up to them. And, you know, if they get into trouble, that's their problem. So it really is a very worrying and I would say close to criminal or at least um, disgraceful from a human perspective set of philosophies. And yet that ideology which came through in the legislation is for me what's underpinning a lot of what's going on. So there's a few examples of things which I think are, uh, you know, the wrong cultural norms. Well, there's a whole bunch of things that I think need to change, but let's sort of start top down. The first question is, what is an economy for, right? It seems to me that's a really important question because at the moment, the answer is the economy is basically, our economy is founded on houses and holes. How, holes meaning we dig up stuff and sell it overseas. Houses is all the property stuff, right? It's a very narrow base. We're one of the narrower economies around the world. If you look at the list of economies around the world, we're white down the bottom, right? So we need to change and think differently about what we're here for in the first place, which is a very philosophical way of saying, it isn't sufficient just to do this, ver these two things, right? We've got to find a broader base, which t is about innovation and investment. And, you know, my personal view is that uh, green transformation should be on the agenda, absolutely. And we should be investing a lot more in that than just building more houses. We've actually got more than enough houses and, and units than we need at the moment, so there's an oversupply. So that, that will be the first thing. The second thing is education. I think that there's a real gap in terms of people's perceptions of property and they understand how mortgages work and all of those things and basically they've been sold a, you know, a spiel for years and years and years which is wrong, right? So it seems to me that there is a really important piece about helping people to understand better about when you commit to a mortgage what are you really committing to? And, you know, do you really think property prices always double every seven years or whatever it is? So that's really important. It's one of the things I try to, to help a little bit from, from with my channel because the level of edu education in schools is appalling. There's very little taught about finance other than, you know, there's no problem with debt. My view is that people need to understand that there is actually a consequence of big debt. Right? So there's an education piece. Then there's a policy piece, which is to say, sure, we do need to continue to build and we need to have the right properties. We need more affordable properties, but we need a different approach because just leasing it to the private sector and assuming that the private sector will uh, somehow build the right types of properties in the right type of places is not right. What's happening is that there is huge speculation in some areas, particularly where there's a lot of inward migration, but there's not enough properties being built in the other. So we need a different approach to planning. We need a different approach to the mix of property that we actually build. And the final element to me is this question about what banks are for. Because banks at the moment in Australia are big building societies. What they're doing is spending more and more of their energy and capital just to lend for more mortgages and trying to build a bigger balance sheet around mortgages. My own view is we've got to actually recognise that that's completely dumb. What we need to be doing is getting the banks to support infrastructure investment and the other things that's going to be building a better economy for the future rather than just lending more for mortgages. So we need to change some of the lending rules, change some of the supervisory structures. In fact, even things like the international rules called the Basel, rule, the Basel rules probably need to be looked at because they're actually just perpetuating the same thing. Um, all of those things come back to a set of political decisions and my point is this is a political thing that we're dealing with here, right? That is actually a set of decisions that have been taken or a set of decisions that have not been taken by lack of action. And there are decisions both at the federal level, so national level, and also at the local level which need to be taken differently. And until we get politicians and people who are... Um, you know, involved in the political process to better understand 
the disaster that's been created by this massive wave of investment in property and the sucking out of value and the hollowing out of people's finances as a result, until we get them to understand that and understand that there has to be a different path, not much will happen. The industry, the building industry is very vocal. They've got a lot of power and influence within the political circles. The banking sector is very powerful. They've got huge influence within the political circles. But we need people to actually say, no, 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 there has to be a different way. And you know, I'm a great believer in people power to start perhaps to think of a different way of thinking about what we're at, which goes right back to my first point. What's society there for in the first place? It isn't just to create bigger banks. It isn't just to you know, create bigger building construction companies. It's something a bit more fundamental than that. What I say to people is just remember this. When you go and you know, talk to a bank about the mo a mortgage on a property, right? Remember the bank will want to lend you more than probably is sensible, right? And so one of the things I always say is do your own modelling and do your own thinking. Don't just take what the bank says. Just because the bank says you can have a million dollars for a property uh, by way of a mortgage, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sensible thing to do. So, you know, use your own discrimination, right? And things like model the cash flows and run a scenario. That says, what happens if rates go up 2% or 3%? Or if I lose my job, what would I do, right? Most people don't do that. Most people say if the bank says it's fine, then I'll just go for it, right? Now, I think that's... So, so there, there's a personal responsibility thing at an individual level, I think. Um, I think, I think beyond that, um, I'm trying, you know, my small way to try and get politicians to understand that the myopic strategy of the last 20 to 30 years is atypical. If you look at 150 years of property price growth, there's only been two times where we've had prices so strong. The first was after the Second World War for a brief period of time, and then post the deregulation in the 1990s. So this is what we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years is atypical of long term, right? And that's important for people to understand. So there's a different perspective that we need. This is a, you know, this isn't this isn't normal, right? And then the final point is if you think about this in terms of an investment uh, pool for the future, right? If we're just going to throw every available dollar at property, then the rest of society and the rest of the community all suffers. And that's the other angle. I think it's important that people push back a bit harder and actually begin to ask, you know, in the next election and beyond what people's policies are beyond housing and beyond property because there's a bunch of other questions that follow from focusing differently on where to invest. So I think uh, we're at close to zero bounds with regard to interest rates, right? So the strategy from the Reserve Bank has been to drive interest rates lower for a good number of years now, but we're close to the, the bottom of the cycle, right? So they can't keep doing that. That was the momentum that created all of the um, growth in property. So we're at the point where that's now run out of smoke. I mean, you could take rates negative, but I'm not sure that that's you know, something which would actually even work at the moment. So, so the Reserve Bank's ammunition in terms of interest rate cuts is done. Right? The second point is that with the migration now looking a lot weaker than it was, demand for property is changing. And we also have this issue with a lot of property investors who've got no chance of selling their property at the moment. So we're going to see some property losses and we're going to see effectively values struggle. But I do think that we will see prices continuing to rise simply because of government policy and because people still want property. So it's going to be more of the same, probably at a slow rate. But even in the most positive view, I don't see the same growth in property values that we saw over the last 20 years. Conditions are not there. Um, we also have the other question, which is what happens with regard to incomes, because incomes have not grown in real terms for a long time. Reserve Bank said quite recently there's not going to be any real income growth for two or three years um, because inflation is in the wrong place and because unemployment is too high. So we know that we've got these economic drivers that are actually creating a lot of pain. Um, so therefore the growth rates will be lower, but it's going to be a replay of the last 
often a few years in my view, which is not good because it just means you're going to have banks with bigger balance sheets, you're going to have property prices even more out of kilter relative to incomes, more people under significant pressure and more of the overall economic activity of the country sucked into property. That's a bad outcome. So the most critical trigger now is what happens if rates rise, right? Now that could be because the Federal Reserve in the US turns turtle and change strategy and rates start to go up. I mean, we've already seen bond rates starting to rise, particularly long-term bond rates. So there is no guarantee that mortgage rates are going to be as low in two to three to four years' time as they are. If rates start to rise, it's all over Red Rover, right? Because people won't be able to afford it. So we are in the situation now because of the precarious nature of those uh, uh, houses with those mortgages. One third of people in Australia have mortgages. Um, they will not be able to manage to repay those mortgages. And that then puts huge pressure on the banks. The bank's capital then gets put under pressure. And so we could see um, you know, a significant cascading event and that would actually even dent the banking system. That's why over the last um, year or so, the government and the Reserve Bank were so critical of trying to keep property prices from falling. So that's why they cut rates. That's why they did, did all their incentives, because they knew that once that trigger starts, once you start to see property prices falling, once you start to see defaults rising, it's almost impossible to stop it. And that's the uh, alternative scenario that I see. At some point, rates will start to rise, and that will be the trigger for a significant correction. And just to give you a bit of sense, property prices are over 40% or 50% over long-term values. So there's a huge overswing of where they should be relative to all the other long-term uh, metrics, right? And um, to, uh, to, to re-purpose um, an analogy that I heard quite recently, it's like holding a beach ball underwater, right? You can hold it down underwater for so long, but the longer you keep it and the further down you hold it underwater, the bigger the sort of the explosion at the end of the, you know, quick, completely comes back. That's what's going to happen to property prices. At some point they will come back but it's probably going to be a long time relative to what many people think because the government and the Reserve Bank will do absolutely everything they can do to stop it from descending down into a more normal level. But at some point, can they, will they be able to you know, keep it up or will it actually come back? I think at some point it will come back, but it may be not immediately. Longer-term demographic shifts, I think. So we've got a lot of people moving into older age. They've got big properties. They don't need those big properties. They need the equity out of those properties. So there's probably going to be a greater propensity to sell some of those big properties, and that will put downward pressure on that end of the market. We also, of course, depends on what happens with migration at the bottom end. We've got Traditionally, we've had significant migration, which has sort of stoked the Ponzi scheme at the bottom end with people coming in. If that migration doesn't come back... That could also be another factor too, but those are a little bit more fuzzy than the, uh, the pure interest rate conversation. Yep. So it's worth noting that over time, the proportion of people who own their property outright has continued to drift down over the last 20 to 30 years. So more people have a mortgage as they go into retirement, which is a problem because of course how they're going to repay that. But also the other trend is we've got a greater proportion of people who will never own property and are, you know, have to rent. So we're seeing essentially the number of people renting going up, the number of people owning property outright going down, and the number who hold a mortgage also going up. So that sort of dynamic suggests that there's going to be a greater proportion of the population who will never own a property, who will never be able to, you know, achieve the dream of property ownership will always be renting and the th people I'm most concerned about are the people who are renting now and will be still renting when they go into old age because they won't have any assets by way of property they'll still have to pay for somewhere to live and all the research suggests that it's those that cohort later in life that are the ones that are going to be most significantly disadvantaged not just sort of over the next two years but over the next 20 to 30 years so it's a very significant social shift that's gone on. And the concept of now of everybody owning a property and you know calling a bit of Australia home, as it were, has gone. We've got more people, more than a third, who are renting and will never own. And we've got more who can only partially own their property because they've got bigger mortgages. 
And so right the way into retirement, they're still paying those mortgages, still basically in hock to the bank. Young people are waiting a lot later to buy than previously. So they used to buy in their early to mid 20s. It tends to be late 30s into 40s now. So first time buyers can be late 30s and 40s, which means that they actually are going to hold their mortgage right into retirement. Right. So that's that's really so that's age shift has, has happened, not least because, of course, many people already own debts from university and other things. Right. So people tend to have bigger debts earlier in their lives to start with in a context where incomes have not gone up, right? So incomes are flat. So the financial pressure on younger people, I think is huge. And it's, again, understated in most of the analysis that's done. So when they do save, when rates are really low, it takes longer to save. Um, That means they buy later. That means that they often buy smaller. They buy further away. So that means from a lifestyle perspective, they've got further to travel. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of consequences that, that come from that. A lot of people can't buy in where they want to buy. They have to buy a lot, a lot further out. So, so that is a big deal. And the other point about it is people start panicking, saying, I haven't bought, I haven't bought, I've got to buy. So, you know, some people buy bad. So they buy a cheap investment property, thinking that's the way to get into the market. And then the investment property doesn't perform. Or they end up buying a really poor quality property that is still a poor property, qu- property quality property later. So they, you know, they can't do much with it. So you can easily end up making bad decisions. And I sometimes say to people, you know, it's like you take a decision today, but it echoes down the decades. The decision you take today and what you do isn't just for today. It's about what you do down the track. So that's a big deal. So, yeah, the young people in particular, I think, are really up against it. And... Many of them, as I said earlier on, many of them are actually grabbing for those incentives, you know, so they'll get money from mum and dad, they'll get money from superannuation funds, they'll get money from the government, and they'll go into the market and commit to these massive mortgages. I've seen some households where 60% of their income, 60% of their income is going to pay the mortgage. That, with rates really low, right? That's why I'm saying there's a horrible conundrum here about the wriggle room or lack of it if rates go up well that's it's my analogy of the black hole right is that it's sucking a lot of stuff a lot of people's futures into this black hole and yeah that's exact, exactly right the only way that it's felt solved is by increasing migration and bringing more people in to sort of try and feed the bottom of the you know of the process which is what the government's been doing for years but you know just increasing migration to save the housing market that's a really dumb strategy Keep wages, you keep wages down even lower. You have higher levels of congestion, um, you know, all of those things. And there's a lot of concerns about that in our major centres at the moment. So, yeah, quality of life goes through the floor. And by the way, it also means you end up with um, these sort of ghettos of high rise uh, apartments where people have come in from overseas and there's, you know, completely different character to what it was. So that's the other, it, it changes society, it changes the environment, it changes, lo, you know, localities. And again, there's very little understanding of how much things are changing and how where, and where it's going. And that's why I say there are some big picture questions here about what sort of society do we want, right? And actually housing and how we deal with housing becomes not just a question of bricks and mortar, but it becomes a societal question. Yeah, so the interesting about thing about supply is that the, we know that there are more properties than there are households, right? By about one and a half to two million. Now, some of those are second homes. A lot of those were bought off the plan or bought um, once completed by overseas investors who've never visited the property. They just bought it and held it. We've got thousands and thousands of those in high-rise developments across Sydney and Melbourne. I think that's a criminal, and my own view is that we should actually um, bring in some legislation to deal with the unoccupied property that is held just for speculation, which is what it is. Um, So that's one area. The other area is um, for people who actually are holding multiple properties, and again, deliberately not letting them out because their argument is as soon as I let out my new property it's no longer new by holding it empty I actually maintain its value 
And that means that when I come to sell it, I'll be able to sell it for even more. There's a lot of that going on. And we've done some work in some areas looking at, for example, water usage and power usage. And you see whole blocks where there's almost nobody living in them. No power, no water. So unoccupied property is a huge issue and no, no political party and no government is prepared at the moment to deal with, I think, one of the most significant issues we've got. So what's interesting about uh, the planning here in Australia is that we actually have specific zones where people are allowed to build. And there have been a lot of tight zoning controls because the councils essentially wanted to try and concentrate development areas. Um, there is an argument to say that that's forced house prices up to an extent. And in fact, there are some economists who blame planning controls and tight restrictions for high house prices. Now, my modelling is suggesting that is a small element in some local areas, but it's also changing because they're now actually facilitating infill development and subdivision in all sorts of areas. So there's a lot of areas where you buy one house on a block and then you knock the house down and put up four villas, right? And that's a way of making money. There's a lot of that going on and that's actually within the planning rules. So I personally think that the discussion about planning zoning is overdone. And in fact, the real reason why property prices have shot up so high is cheap credit, big credit and low interest rates. And in fact, modelling the relativity of those two things, planning, zoning and the lending side of it. In fact, there's about a five to one relationship in terms of the movement in prices. So in other words, lending has a five times more powerful impact on house prices than zoning. In Australia, of course, Australia is a huge country, right? But in fact, if you look at where we live, we tend to live sort of in the very narrow regions around the edge, right? So in fact, the amount, of development, the amount of development land is actually quite restricted in some areas. And so there's been a big debate as to how, it, how you should deal with that. Do you actually try and extend further into the bush and allow bigger areas? Or do you actually focus in on infilling and essentially trying to reuse the land we've got better? Um, there's quite a lot of intent at the moment to um, increase the density closer into cities. So that's where they actually put in low rise compared with a house or indeed um, create larger high rise developments. And there's been some growth areas where they've actually focused on significant amounts of uh, high rise development to try and deal with this. But the real truth is that Australia has no land supply problem. Now we've got massive amounts of it. It's a doctrinal positional situation partly to do with where the councils are, partly to do with where power lies, and partly to do with people holding onto land because they think that in 20 or 30 years it's going to be worth a lot more. And there's quite a lot of that going on at the moment. In, in an environment where you think long-term values are going to go up, it's actually a very good investment. And quite a few big building companies in Australia hold huge parcels of land over many, many decades. Right? In the short term, I think that we have got to find a different financial structure than the one we've currently got, because at the moment people are just overcommitted and just uh, on a different trajectory. But the trouble is, the more you help people in in the short term, you know, first time grants and things, what you do is you lift prices even higher. So longer term, we have to find a different balance. And the only way actually to solve this is to allow prices to come back to where they should come back to. So actually the best way to solve housing affordability is to have a property crash. Um, well, the bubble is meant to be a, probably a short-term thing that sort of comes up and comes down. We're in a structurally engineered meta bubble, right? Which means it's gone on for 20 to 30 years because there are so many forces, so it's not really a true bubble, it's something much more structural, which basically means that, yes, we are in that sort of structural bubble and it's going to continue unless we change tack.
we, we actually need a policy change at the top. You can't just say, oh, it's interest rates or it's you know, land supply. There's a, policy, there's a set of policy settings which are wrong and have been structurally wrong for at least 20 years in Australia. Probably us, way around the world, by the way. It goes back to the financialization of property. We have to change that if we want to tackle this. Otherwise, all we'll be doing will be putting more short-term fixes in to try and solve bits of the puzzle. We've got to solve this structurally. And in fact, um, it, I think it was the, um, at the UN, uh, one of the senior people then spoke about the financialization of property being the biggest challenge that we actually face in Western worlds, simply because of it's so much rooted into what we do and it's, it's just gobbling up so much of what we do. So this is a real structural policy question, it really is. It can go on and on and on for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, my view is that uh, governments um, will do all they can to stop this thing blowing up in their face. It's not politically acceptable for it to blow up. Um, in the last election cycle, our prime minister committed to keeping house prices high. Tactically speaking, politicians will win because it means the prices don't crash. But we're building ourselves up a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. And at some point, it will it will just fall in on itself. It's a question of, you know, is it a decade out? Is it a year out? It could be a long time out. But we're, but, but it goes back to my, but, but the more you do it, the more you're socially disadvantaging the rest of society, the more you're actually not investing in the things you should be investing in. And that's my problem.